Hello friends, welcome to Science Talk. I am your host and resident oceanographer, Jim Essa. Okay, this is a very interesting uh, little article here. Came out at the end of November. Climate change is making one of the world's strongest currents flow faster. Okay, and as you can see, it's fizz.org, a little brief report that they published. And here's a photo of a person deploying an Argo float, which basically collects data into the Southern Ocean. And as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of water there. <laughs> so what are they talking about? They're talking about the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, also abbreviated as ACC. The only ocean current that circumnavigates the planet is speeding up. Basically, if you were to head to about 60 degrees south latitude, thereabouts, and you can find the Antarctic Circumpolar Current right about that location, and you could ride it right around the whole planet. Because if you stay at that latitude, you're not going to find any land mass. So as a result, the current can really, because there's nothing to impede its flow, it gets really fast. For the first time, scientists are able to tell that this is happening by looking at decades-long, you know, observational uh, records and data. Researchers from Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and UC Riverside use satellite measurements of sea surface height and data collected by the global network of ocean floats called Argo, to detect a trend in Southern Ocean upper layer velocity that has been difficult to ascertain until now. Basically, they deployed a whole bunch of these types of instruments to get the, the desired data. Now, when you look at, now, you look at the sea surface height, it's, uh, it's called also a geodesic height there. What that does is, it sets up what we call pressure gradients. So in other words, where the water is a little higher, that means there's more water. You know, if we were to go down to whatever level, 10 meters, 100 meters, whatever, if you were to calculate the pressure at the bottom of that 10 meters or 100 meters or any other desired depth, because the water is higher, there's more pressure on that location than if you go to where the water is lower. So what happens is that the water will f uh, follow the pressure gradient. It just simply flows, you know, basically flows downhill. It goes from the, the higher water location to the lower water location. It gets uh, very detailed. I discussed uh, a lot of this in a prior video uh, called the rotating systems. If you're interested in getting all the, uh, the gory details of the physics involved. But basically, that, the differences in the height could actually help set up you know, how fast a current moves. The team representing the uh, National Science uh, Foundation funded Southern Ocean Carbon Climate Observation Modeling, or SOCOM, project reports its findings in the November 29th issue of the journal Nature Climate Change. So for the full report, you can go to that uh, publication. Prevailing westerly winds have sped up as climate warms. Okay, we're warming up the atmosphere. We're creating a, a temperature differential and if you have creating a temperature differential, you're also going to create a pressure differential. Warmer temperatures exert less pressure, but you're going to have a stronger gradient in the temperature and the pressure. And the stronger gradient translates to stronger winds. Winds push on the surface of the water. Stronger winds pushing on the water is going to make the currents that result flow faster. That's the basic short synopsis of what's happening. Models show that the wind speed up does not change the ocean currents much. 
rather it energizes ocean eddies. Now, what they to, to clarify that, the ocean currents are still going to flow in the direction they're flowing. So that's not going to be altered, but it's going to energize ocean eddies. What are ocean eddies? These are basically, they, they range in size from several meters to several uh, tens of meters to several hundreds of uh, meters to, kil to tens of kilometers to hundreds of kilometers across. They are the result of the fact that the Earth is a spheroid object that's rotating. And you got fluids sloshing around on it. So when you have currents flowing, you're going to get eddies, or you know, sometimes called mesoscale eddies, if on the order of tens of kilometers to hundreds of kilometers, that pinch off. Basically, it's trying to balance the geostrophic flow, which is related to the geodesic height that I described earlier, along with the Coriolis parameter, the wind stress that's imparted to the, to the water. So that's, that's basically what's happening. For example, when we look at, uh, you know, diagrams of the Gulf Stream, they always show it as this nice little ribbon that flows straight up. The actuality is there's a whole bunch of eddies that are always pinching off the main flow because of, well, in case of the, the Gulf Stream, you also have Western intensification that has to be taken into consideration along with the geostrophic flow, wind stress, Coriolis, etc all trying to be in balance uh, with that and these uh, eddies they tend to be circular uh, motions they tend to be running counter to the main current so it'll pinch you off they may pinch you off perpendicularly or even uh, head backwards in the direction that they just came from it depends on a whole bunch of factors including uh, uh, even what we uh, uh, called topographic steering. Probably not too much of a factor in the Southern Ocean with the ACC, but that also affects the, the flow as well. From both observations and models, we find that the ocean heat change is causing the significant ocean current acceleration detected during recent decades. Said uh, Jia Rui Shi, who is now a uh, a postdoctoral researcher at, at Woods Hole. We, I discussed with you before how much heat is in the ocean. The ocean has absorbed 93% of all greenhouse gas heat released by humans in the last 50 years to the tune of a latest than 240 zettajoules of 2,000 meters, of which about 68% of that is in the upper five to 700 meters. So that can be about, you know, it's approximately about what, 184 zettajoules. When you have heat, that's, a, you know, all this heat there with the, with the uh, surrounding deeper cold water, this can also create further gradients as well. The speed up of the ACC, especially as jet centered on the sub Antarctic front, facilitates property exchange, such as heat or carbon, between ocean basins and creates the opportunity for these properties to increase in subsurface, subtropical regions. So now we're talking not just strictly sticking you know, along a zonal aspect, but now moving meridionally, going from polar regions to subtropical regions. The ACC encircles Antarctica, and this is important, very important. The ACC encircles Antarctica and separates cold water in the south from warmer subtropical water just to its north. The warmer part of the Southern Ocean takes up a lot of the heat that human activities are adding to Earth's atmosphere. I just alluded to that. For this reason, scientists consider it vital to understand its dynamics, since what happens there, it could influence climate everywhere else. Of course. Ocean warming pattern is important. When the gradient or the amount of heat difference between warm and cold water increases, currents between those two masses speed up. The fact that the Earth rotates helps facilitate that aspect as well. 
The ACC is mostly driven by wind. I just described that to you. You have a greater gradient in the temperature, which means also the pressure. That's going to increase the wind speed, which increases the force, wind forcing, that happens on the surface of the water, which then increases how the water moves. Long-term data capturing uh, changes in the Southern Ocean were hard to come by before the availability of satellite-mounted instruments in the Argo network. That network, oh, and these are all floats, which measure ocean conditions such as temperature and salinity, began in 1999, reached full capacity eight years later, and there's 4,000 or so of these things across the world's oceans, continuing to collect data. And what's nice is you can sit in your office and wait for the data to bounce off a satellite and be downloaded into your computer. You don't have to get out there in, uh, in those uh, kind of uh, challenging conditions, let's put it that way. So using this basic decade's worth of comprehensive data, they were able to determine this accelerating current from natural variability. The uh, researchers said that it's also likely that the speed of the current will increase even more so as the Southern Ocean continues to absorb heat from human activity. So, um, there's another aspect of what humans are doing to the planet. Now, the ACC is also has some of the highest uh, velocities of any occurrence on the planet. It has definitely some of the highest sphere drops in uh, of capacity. Recall that a sphere drop is, uh, you know, one million cubic meters, 10 to the 6, of water flowing past a point per second. Now, that simply basically tells you the volume per second does not necessarily tell you the speed, what the velocity would be. So for example, I could have a, a current that's say 1,000 meters wide, it's 1,000 meters thick, okay? That means in order to have one sphere drop, you know, 10 to the six meters per second flow, that current would be moving at the rate of one meter per second, okay? But now let's say I've got that same current, but instead of being a thousand meters uh, deep, it's a hundred meters deep. Well, to get 10 to the six cubic meters of water per second, now the current has to move itself as an entity 10 meters per second. So you see how we can have the same volume flowing per second but we, unless you know the dimensions, the thickness, the width, etc., you're not going to really going to be able to know what the velocity is. You just look at the, consider the two examples I just provided. So now the question is, how do you determine the velocity? Simple. Shove a flow meter in there. And you measure it directly. And I bet you in the Argo instrumentation here, in addition to salinity and, and density, there might be a little flow meter in there, or some of them, will, you know, they're, they're going to have different designs of it to measure different types of parameters that researchers are interested in. Some, as, as the article said, will look at density and salinity. Some will have a flow meter in there. Some uh, will look at temperature. Some will look at, uh, you know, the the, the uh, CO2 concentration or the phosphate concentration, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to get as much of the chemical and physical characteristics so that we can then look for long term trends, long term changes. So, this does have implications. You know, absorbing all that heat is driving increased wind, it's uh, creating a greater temperature differentials in the ocean. All this is combining to drive the ACC to move faster and faster, which means that if the velocity picks up, the sphere drops will also increase as well. So this is something to keep an eye on. Talk to you soon.
Hello folks, this is Jim here with Science Talk, asking you to please subscribe to my channel and to inform others of my channel and of the work that I do. Please share to social media platforms that you use. Also, as a reminder, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I load up more videos. Finally, I ask that you support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. Details in the description box below. Thank you for your support.